Well, good morning, everybody. How's everyone doing? Hey, welcome to Wednesday night Oasis for July 26. It's the last uh, Wednesday of the month, and I hope everyone is doing well. Uh, I want to thank everybody for for uh, your support and things that you're doing around at the church, and and God is on the move. So we're so excited about that. Hey, we are uh, in part four of the series. Uh, titled The Battle Within and uh, we've been talking about things like fear and 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 uh, uh, tonight tonight we're we're turning our attention to something that you might be able to use for someone else because I know you don't ever have trouble with this but it's called battling within when it comes to depression ever been depressed ever found yourself in that place where you were like just all in and having trouble even getting up sometimes in the morning um, if you haven't been there praise the Lord for that but I think that this message it's a classic message from way back in I think 2017 uh, I, I hope it speaks to you it is part uh, part four of the series and uh, it, it should speak to your heart you know it's really amazing to me as I go back and watch the messages uh, very often the messages that uh, that we're we're talking about in our series could have been from 30 years ago and they could be today so it's relevant to our lives and I praise the Lord for that that that's the way it's working out so you watch this next message and and uh, Sunday just remember we're we're in part two of our series and uh, um, road trip it's called road trip and uh, this next week we're talking about how to avoid um, burnout when it starts to come into your life ever been burned out hey you don't want to miss that message because it's going to speak to your heart I believe I know it, it has mine uh, I always uh, I joke around and I say well I always go through uh, the things that I preach on and so uh, this is no different than anything else we all run across this from time to time i'm really good though and i'm uh, really excited about what god's doing so although today i'm not burned out i've had burned out times in my life and i'm sure you have too so you will uh, be a part of that series if you can come down and i'd love to see you all right you have a blessed week love you guys talk to you soon The battle within we said that there are many battles going on in our world today for sure and that the truth is that the sometimes the biggest battle that we face is the battle that happens within us in week one we talked about one of the attacks that come upon us and that attack is called disappointment I'm sure that uh, from time to time we've all had moments of disappointment in our lives in week two we talked about fear how fear is is something that that we can we can have attack us at times last week we talked about shame and and it, it's really kind of amazing how God works sometimes because I walked away from that message thinking this one was a stinker and, and you know it wasn't it wasn't one of my best messages it wasn't the greatest one 
and I received phone calls and messages from people that, boy, that was so good, and that really did this to me and all this, and I says, okay, well, praise the Lord for that, praise the Lord for that. Today, we're going to talk about something that I know, first of all, nobody in this room has ever battled with. None of us have ever had this feeling that, that comes upon us, the attack that comes upon us. It's called depression. Depression. So if you're watching from home and you're dealing with this, and, or, or if you've never dealt with it just like we've never dealt with it, um, listen to this message because I think it will help you to minister to others. And the reality is it'll minister to us as well. Let's pray. Well, dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, Father, asking for your guidance and direction through our message today. We pray, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would give us wisdom concerning our own lives and, and uh, how to deal with the depression that, that enters our lives from time to time. So, Lord, uh, guide and direct us through this. We know, Lord, that your truth sets us free. In Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I want to begin by saying, all kidding aside, that depression is one of these things that affect all of us at one level or another. Sometimes there are people who are really get def affected by it. Sometimes it just depends on the situation and it depends on the circumstances we're looking through. Today, we're talking about circumstantial depression. The, the depression that comes upon us because of things that have happened to us, things that happen to us, stuff that tries to come at us, and it, and it makes us depressed. Uh, I, I'll have you know that in history, this is not a new story. I mean, uh, people have battled depression through in, our, in our world through history. Hans Christian Andersen battled depression. Ernest Hemingway, F. Scott Fitzgerald, were actually hospitalized because of it. Uh, Irving Berlin, Edgar Allan Poe, Abraham Lincoln and Teddy Roosevelt both battled depression. And then uh, the great reformer Martin Luther uh, battled this depression in a terrible way. Uh, Martin Luther said this, uh, and this is a quote, for more than a week, I was close to the gates of death and hell. I trembled in all my members. Christ was wholly lost. I was shaken by desperation and blasphemy of God. Martin Luther. He was in a bad place. I mean, his whole life, uh, he, he ended up dying down back in in 1546, but uh, the, the reality was depression was something that he battled on a regular basis. And the truth about depression is that it is no respecter of men and women. It affects people who are, are rich or poor, educated or uneducated. Uh, depression has a way of uh, attacking Christ followers or or people who are religious people or irreligious people. The, the truth of the matter is not one of us is immune to this. But the Bible has something to say about it. The Bible wants to show us how do you deal with uh, depression when it comes into your life. Let me tell you something. Uh, I don't know when it is that you're watching this from home, but if you're watching it in the next day or so, let me tell you something. We have just been coming through this thing called the pandemic. And there are several people, there are many, many, many people who had to deal with all of the battles that we've been talking about. Discouragement, fear. They're battling things like depression. You know, there's a word that our world is trying to influence into our lives and we have to reject it because it's called it's called uh, 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 the new normal 
the new normal. Listen, something is either normal or it's not normal. There's no new normal. There's not normal and normal is another word for normal. But uh, friends, listen. God has something to say to this. We're going to look at a story today that of a guy that was written about 3,000 years ago. It's from this guy uh, um, um, named Elijah. Uh, and uh, um, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, it's a story of Elijah, and it comes to us. It, he's first introduced to us in 1 Kings chapter 17. And he came on the scene with a bang. I mean, Elijah is called to this to this position as a powerful prophet and he's speaking into the lives of the people of Israel and the backsliders and the the leaders of that day. Elijah also, he spoke to this guy who was a king and his wife, his name was Ahab and her name was Jezebel. Ever hear of her? Uh, We're going to talk about her. She's, She's a Lulu. Let's put it that way. And it's not in the Bible that way. But uh, 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 during Elijah's life, he ministered in such a powerful, miraculous way. God used him in such tremendous way. Listen, Elijah spent two years in the desert, and he was being fed by ravens, by ravens. That's God, right? Because here he is in the desert, and the birds are feeding him. Now, I'm sure they probably weren't steak and lobster, but they were feeding him anyway. Uh, uh, He raised a widow's son to life after he had died. He called on the power of God to come down in front of hundreds of believers uh, believers, uh, on Mount Carmel. Elijah was so used by God. Uh, I mean... He used, Elijah was used by God to minister to all of these people. And now he finds himself in the desert again. And he's the one that in the Bible, he's the only one, uh, I mean, compared to Jesus, right? Uh, but but he, he, was, he was like, he was raised to heaven without dying. You know what I mean? He, just, he had his... He had his Air Jordans on, you know, I mean, he just, he went, he went up to be in heaven. So here's a guy that, let me tell you something, I, I seen God work in my life, I've seen him work in our, our lives and the lives of our people here, but let me tell you something, I, I, I can't say that I've seen him work in my life like he did in Elijah's life quite that much. Elijah was a powerful man of God. Now, now, there's a lot of things written about Elijah that comes to us in chapter 19, and it chronicles um, this battle that Elijah faces with depression. It tells us what he had to deal with, and it shows us uh, how do we step through this when we find ourselves being attacked by an enemy called depression. Uh, 1 Kings 19.4, it says this, while he himself Am I coming through? This is working. Here we go. Am I on? Huh. Take two. Let's just try this. We'll see what we'll see how long it lasts and then I'll go to that other thing. No, no, I'm good. I should be good. Um, First Kings nineteen four. It says this. 
While he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord. He said, take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Let me ask you something. Have you ever found yourself saying to God, I've had enough? I mean, I, I, I have. I know I have. People say that uh, all the time. Uh, you know, we get to this place in our lives and we go, Lord, I'm done. Stick a fork in me. You know, I'm done. And then he says, I'm no better than my ancestors. Every Bible scholar believes that what's happening here is that Elijah, at this point, is in big time depression. That's good. Next week, our message is on anger. I'll be talking about <laughs> I'll be talking about today when I'm done with, with this. All right, here we go. So uh, Elijah is finding himself in this place where he is super depressed. Here's, here's what a, a definition of depression is. Uh, it, this, is a, this is a medical definition of what it is. And it's really a biblical definition, too. Depression is a mood disorder that involves a persistent feeling of sadness and loss of interest. It is different from a mood fluctuation that people regularly experience at part of their lives. That describes Elijah. Elijah is in this place where he says, I've had enough. Take me out of here, Lord. Now, some of us hearing this message, we think, man, Elijah was really suffering. And, and the point I want us to understand is that there were circumstances that were happening that caused him to take this path. Now, here's what you should know. Elijah, in one week, had really been through it. Because the day before he became depressed, he was on top of the world. He was up, up, up. I mean, uh, one day he was super high. Great things were happening. God was moving. And, and he was so excited. And then the next day he hears from the king's wife, Jezebel, and uh, not so much. He's really down. Uh, so he, this is the story. And I want to I encourage you this week to go and look at 1 Kings chapter 18. And I want you to read through that because you're going to get a good flavor of what's happening. But, but here, here's what's happening. One day he's up, next day he's down. He, the Bible, some of your Bibles might say he was downcast. The, the truth is downcast and depressed, same. Same thing, same meaning. So here's what it says next. 1 Kings 19.10 He, Elijah, replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord, God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altar, and put your prophets to death with a sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me. Let me ask you something. When you're battling and you find yourself being depressed, you ever feel like you're the only one left? I'm the only one. Nobody knows what I'm going through. Only me. That's what Elijah was going through. That's how he felt. You know, the, 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 I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me. Now, uh, now Elijah, really, you have to know, go back just a little bit. Here's a guy who says, I'm no better than my ancestors. And I have to tell you that if I'm God and, and Elijah says that, wouldn't you say, what are you talking about? I fed you in the desert for two years through the birds. I, I used you to heal somebody who died, a widow woman's son that had died. I've used you in front of hundreds of people 
to show that God was real and that what you were saying was true. See, just let me give you a little, a little background on chapter 18 because that's what I want you to go back and really read it. But here's what was happening. It was a banner day for Elijah because everything was going his way. God called Elijah to show the prophets of Baal. Now the prophets of Baal, there were 450 of them and they, they believed in this God of Baal. And so uh, God wanted him, Elijah, to show them that who they're worshiping is nobody, is nothing. It's not God. So uh, Elijah challenges them to a contest. So now it's 450 prophets of Baal against Elijah and God. Now if, if you, if this was Caesar's palace, bet on Elijah and God, right? Against the 450 prophets of Baal. You don't want to be vote, voting for them or rooting for them. So here they do, here's what they do. They set up two altars of wood and one of them was, that was going to be for the prophets of Baal. And whichever God lit on fire without matches or any of that stuff, without any of that kind of thing, that God is God. So here are the prophets of Baal and they start out in the morning and, they, and here they are and they're dancing around the altar and, the, and they're looking for a flame and it's not even warm. And then Elijah sees this going on, and he sees nothing's happening. And Elijah was really sensitive and caring towards them. Let's let me show you. First uh, Kings eighteen twenty seven through twenty nine. Here's what he says: At noon, Elijah begins to taunt them. How do you like that? He begins to taunt them. Hey, shout louder! He said. Sure, he is a God. Perhaps he's deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe it's a travel day for him. Maybe he's sleeping and he must be awakened. I mean, uh, it, so they shouted louder. They slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their customs, and then their blood flowed. Midday passed and they continued their frantic prophesying uh, until the time of the evening sacrifice. But there was no response, no answer. No one paid attention to what was going on. Now Elijah says, okay, let's do this. And he takes stones, he takes 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And he tells them, bring water, wet the wood. How's that for, for, for insult to injury, right? And, and then pour the water on the wood. I mean, soak it. Then they brought in a, a bull, bull pieces of a bull and laid it there for a sacrifice. And he instru instructed these people, back up. I mean, get ready. 1 Kings 18.35, it says, The water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench because they put a trench around it. I mean, they were really soaking this thing. Verse 38, Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil as licked up the water in the trenches and it, it also licked up that water in the trenches. Now, if you're Elijah, let me tell you something. You're having a great day, right? You're having a great day. The 450 prophets of Baal are now gone. They're dead. And Ahab goes back and he goes, Hun, you'll never believe what happened today. And he tells his wife. 
Jezebel. Well, Jezebel very calmly had a message for Elijah. 1 Kings 19.2. So Jezebel sent a message to Elijah to say, May the God deal with me be as ever so severely if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like the one of them, like the ones that are dead. If by tomorrow this time you're still living, may God just do to me what he did to that, you know, may I be dead. Now what does Elijah do if this happens? You have just seen the power of God working mightily. You've seen the flames of wood uh, on wet wood. You've seen God do all of this. And so what did he do? Did Elijah laugh at what she said? Did he, did he, say, did he say to her, Jezebel, come near to me and I'll do to you what happened to those 450 prophets of Baal? No, that didn't happen. Here's what happened. Verse 3, Elijah was afraid, and he ran for his life. Can you believe that? He was afraid, and he ran for his life. He, when he came to Bathsheba uh, in Judah, he left his servants there. Now we've re we began reading that verse 4, where Elijah says, uh, Stick a fork in me, I'm done. Lord, I've had enough. Uh, you know, I, take me now. Here's his problem. He took his eyes off of God and he put it on Bathsheba or uh, on uh, Jezebel. He put it on to Jezebel. How does that happen? Does that ever happen to you? Do you ever take your eyes off God and put it on the problem? You ever take your eyes on God and then allow something that looks like this big hairy thing to depress you when reality God is bigger than what is trying to depress you? Listen, here's Elijah's problem. He felt like people were not getting it. He felt like his life was worthless and it was hopeless. Elijah was super depressed. Now, before we get into what God says about how to handle depression, here's what you have to know, and I'm going to say this right away. There's different types of depression, and I never want to minimize depression because depression is a terrible thing. And there are some people who battle with a clinical type depression and they need counseling and they need, you know, maybe medication and those things. And I get that. And I never would say, don't do that. But what Elijah was dealing with was depression from his circumstances. And God is dealing with that kind of depression. And he wants us to understand that there is an answer to this. Because some of you who are listening say, you know, when the sun doesn't shine, I get depressed. I get that. Some might say when the weather changes, I get depressed. I, 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 I could understand that. People deal with different things. See, here's what happens sometimes in our own lives. People deal with depression in all different ways. I could be depressed. Pastor Andy could get depressed. Can you believe that? I never said that before at church. But Pastor Andy has opportunities to get depressed. You know, sometimes, sometimes what happens, and it's all the enemy, right? It's the enemy that tries to attack us. But um, we come to church on Sunday, and I'm so excited to see everybody. I love everybody. I mean, this is, this is like when family gets together, I get to see you guys. 
and, and the reality of it is then I preach my sermon on Sunday morning and sometimes what happens is I'll come home and I'll go, well, I don't think that was so bad. But last week, I went home and I went, that was a stinker. That was terrible. God's not happy with me. You see, uh, what happens is you get to this place sometimes where you think, well, I've been given a privilege and an honor to do something. And when it doesn't come out quite right, I didn't do very well. And so, friends, listen. It, 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 so do you feel bad for me? Everybody can go, oh, you ready? Okay. Oh, that's good. I feel better now. But see, here, here's what happens. When that happens, I have to stop myself. And I have to think, you know, God is the orchestrator of everything. And then when things happen the way they do, when we have troubles, when we have issues, it's a learning process. He's teaching us. He's showing us how we have to do things. And we have to realize that sometimes things are not perfect, but we know the one who makes them perfect. Amen. So we, we have to find ourselves in this place where we say, okay, you know, we get it and we see ourselves and we could be a little bit depressed. But then we have to work, turn our attention back to the one who delivers us out of our depression. See, if you're watching today and you say you battle depression, everyone gets it whether they are willing to admit it or not because we all have moments when we kind of feel a little off or we feel a little down. And God doesn't want us to be sad about that. He wants us to step through it. Uh, here's what it says in 1 Kings 19.5. Because here's how Elijah starts to deal with this. Then he lays down under a, a bush and fell asleep. And all at once, an angel touches him and said, get up and eat. I love that. I love this because I love the part, I underlined this, I think I did in your notes, where the angel touches him. Because the angel is the messenger of God, right? It's God, the angel touching him, God's touching him, right? And so you have to know this, here he is, he's out in the middle of nowhere, he's so down that he's sleeping in the under a tree and God says hey come on and then God begins to outline for him the same thing he wants to outline for you and me because uh, when we have those moments when we just want to lay down God is there and he wants to touch us look, look at what um, it says in Hebrews 13, 5. God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. When I get depressed, when you get depressed, listen, we have to know that in those most difficult times, God is with us. And sometimes he can be with us and we don't feel it. But it doesn't mean that he's not with us, right? And some of you know this more than I have, right? Because when we get depressed, what do we do? We have a lot of questions for God, don't we? Why is this happening? Why am I feeling this way? I'm a faithful person. I believe in you. And you see, God says that even in those moments when we want to ask 20 questions to God, what he really wants us to know is that my hand is on you and I'm touching you and I'm with you and I'm going to see you through.
through this. You see, isn't it awesome to know that even in our most hard times, that God says, I care, I love you, I know what you're battling today, I know what you're dealing with, and I'm going to help you. Man, sometimes that feeling is something we feel inside, and other times it's something that we have to know by faith that God is with us. So Elijah's encounter shows us really three things that God wants him to understand, that he wants you and I to understand today as well, because it's really important. The first one is this. You and I, God wants us to get real. Isn't that just the thing to say? God wants us to get real. When we look at this, this story of Elijah, God allows him to um, admit the battle that he's facing without shame or judgment. God doesn't say, come on, what's wrong with you? Why are you feeling that way? Why is this going on? Elijah says, Lord, I'm going to be transparent with you, and I'm just going to be open, and I'm going to tell you this. And so here's what happens. Uh, verse 4, it's in 1 Kings 19, 4. While he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to that broom bush, sat down under the tree, under, under and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, he said to the Lord. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Elijah had a great day the day before. God was using him in powerful ways. Elijah won that day, and Jezebel ruined it because he got his eyes off of God and onto her. See, there's, there's always a place in our lives where God says, tell me what's going on with you. looking for lip service. He's not looking for us to say, I'm fine, God. He wants us to tell the truth. He wants us to speak it out. And God says, I'm with you. I understand that. I worked for a guy one time who was on top of the world. Here is a guy who was a million, million, millionaire. I don't know how many millions, but millions of dollars. And he owned the company I worked for. And so he would have meetings, this is in Minnesota, at his house that was on a place called Lake Minnetonka. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Those of you in Minnesota have heard of that. But anyway, it's a big lake and there are houses that are mansion houses on the lake. So he had this party at his house and all of the directors and vice presidents went there and we were all there at his house. And uh, all of a sudden, where's Rob? Now Rob was about 30 years old, young man. He wasn't an old man. And he had a beautiful wife. He had wonderful kids. He had this house that was like in the movie. You know what I mean, in the movies. And I'm, I'm looking down, and, I, and I'm looking down towards the water, and here's Rob sitting on a bench, one of these white picket benches, looking out at the water. And I go out and see Rob. He says, hey, Rob, what's going on? And he looked at me, and he goes, I'm doing great. And so I ask him again, what's going on? And Rob says, I'm 30 years old. I'm successful. Look at my house. Do you see my wife? Have you seen my kids? I mean, I have everything, everything that could make me happy. It's 
So, Andy, here's my question. Is that all there is? Is this it? He was so depressed. It wasn't, I mean, you couldn't even explain it. And we were on top of the world. The company was doing amazing. Everything was going well. And I said to him, Rob, I said, I'm going to ask you a question. I don't know if you like it or not. Do you know who God is? Oh, yeah, 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 I, I do, I do. My parents were Christians. I, I said, do you know who God is? And he says, he says, well, I, I, I kind of do. He says, but I, I, I really, I'm not a religious person. I said, Rob, I says, you're not going to get out of this until you understand where your joy comes from. And that until you get to a place where you say, I need God in my life, you're going to battle what you're battling. Well, he did. He did battle with that for a long time. He lost his business and he lost just about everything. And then he accepted the Lord. Darn it, if he would have just done it sooner, he could have gave me all that stuff. But it doesn't work that way. God wants us to be real with him. He doesn't want any lip service. If you're, listen, hey, if you've lost your spouse, here's what you got to do. You got to go to God and say, this stinks. I hate this. I don't like it. I know she's with you. I know he's with you. I know, I know, I know. But listen, I hate this. That's where the depression begins to leave. The second thing God wants Elijah to know is that God says, take care of your body. You need to take care of your body. Does he really say that? Let's look. Verses 6 through 8. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over a hot coals in a jar of water. He ate and drank and then laid down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. And he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by the food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. Certainly God wanted Elijah to eat and drink and rest. He wanted him to do that because there was a long journey ahead. But God wanted him to understand that he needs to take care of his body. He needs to do the right things to make himself strong. He needs to do his part. I always say God does his part and he wants us to do our part. He shows us what we need to do in God's word. Then he wants us to do it. You see, that's kind of how it works with God. So science tells us that sometimes depression is something that comes to us through the whole body. It's something that is uh, not only wrong thinking, but sometimes uh, uh, lack of sleep can control your emotions. If you don't eat right, it can control how you're doing. Listen, I'm kind of mild-mannered, but when I go too long without eating, I'm, I'm, I'm not friendly. I'm not that friendly because something happens within me. You know what I mean? I get, I get like, give me a piece of candy or something that I have to have something. 
You know what I mean? Because I'm going to pass out or something. I don't know what it is. But listen, depression can be affected by the physical body. So God wants us to get real with him, and he wants us to take care of our physical bodies. And you have to ask yourself, if you're battling depression, am I eating right? Am I sleeping right? Am I, am I spending time with God? Am I filling my mind with the things that are right? You see, get real, take care of your body, and then do a third thing. Here it is. You need to begin to process what has happened. Most of the time when you and I are depressed, we're not seeing things clearly. We have to start processing what's going on. Here's here's what happens. Uh, God in this next verse, he's with Elijah, he's talking to Elijah, and he's been following God for 40 days and 40 nights in the Harab. And here's what happens, verse 9. Uh, 1 Kings 19.9. There he went into a cave, and he spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Stop there for just a minute, because we're going to look at verse 10 next, but stop there for a second. If you're Elijah, what are you saying? What do you mean, what am I doing here? You told me to follow you, to come here. What do you mean? I'm doing what you said. But that's not what Elijah says. Here's how he replies, verse 10. He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down the altars, and put the prophets to death with a sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me. Here's what's interesting. Right after that was Elijah's response, you know what God does? He asks him the same question again. Okay, I know that's what you're saying, Elijah, but what's really going on? He's not the only one. You'll find out in the story there were 7,000 or there was thousands that were on his side. He wasn't the only one. His depression allowed him to see things in the wrong way, that, that everyone is against him, all of this stuff. See, Elijah allowed himself to be controlled by what was his depression rather than processing what's going on, rather than seeing things for what they really are. See, when you're depressed, I don't know about you, but you don't always see things clearly. Do you? Do you see things clearly when you get depressed? Uh Uh-uh. If you do, God bless you, because the truth is, I don't think any of us uh, d- uh, d- is seeing clearly. See, Elijah spoke it out to God, and he told him how he was feeling. He said, this is what's going on. And God says, I want you to think about this a little bit. Why did this happen? And he answered the same way again. Uh, you, you, you have to know that sometimes depression can cause you to just be out of line, out of control. When I first started in ministry, Tom, you'll get a kick out of this. When I first started in ministry, right, I always thought that my job was to make everybody happy. I'm the pastor. My job is to make everybody happy, so if you want something, you just call me and I'll make it happen. But here's the problem. What happens if you want something to happen and you don't? I make you happy and you don't get happy. And I get this one happy and I don't, oh, I don't like this or I don't like that or I don't. And it's like, God grabbed a hold of me one day and he says, Andy, what are you doing here? I'm trying to work for you, God. I'm trying to do the right thing. I'm trying to make everybody happy, and I can't seem to do it because when I make one person happy, someone else doesn't, is not happy, and maybe I'm just not cut out for this. Maybe this is not the job I'm supposed to have. Maybe you're supposed to use me some way else. And God says, I don't call. Your job is to 
speak what I teach, my word. You, your job is to teach people what I say, whether they like it or not. Yeah. And let me tell you that very often, because I'm a person that wants everybody to be happy, I battle this because I love everyone. And uh, let's just face it, you could love everyone, and everyone is not always going to love you. And I'm okay with that. Uh, look at what it says in verse 11 and 12. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountain apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind was, it was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake was a fire, but guess what? The Lord was not in the fire. After the fire came, there was a gentle whisper. Listen, here's what happens. Here's the big mistake you and I make. If you get anything out of the service, get this one. Sometimes we look for God's voice in the earthquake, in the wind, in the fire, and God's voice is in the whisper. Sometimes we just have to get quiet. That's why they call it quiet time. You and I spending quiet time with God. So in the midst of the battle, you might hear his voice, you might not. But the reality is you have to get away from that and you have to get quiet with God and let his small voice direct you. Friends, I don't know where you find yourself today, but the truth is this. Maybe you've allowed your life to be distorted with depression. And I want you to know that God says, what are you doing? It's time to get quiet. It's time to accept him and to allow him to be the one who fights our battles for us. Because on our own, we can do nothing. So maybe, maybe you've never asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life. We never want to leave a service without giving you that opportunity to ask him to come in. I want to invite you all to pray with me right now and to ask Jesus to come into your life. And, uh, and uh, then we'll move on to the last song of our service. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. I repent of my sins. I accept you now as my personal Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name.